great. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Sonia Valov, and this is Eric Minical. And uh, we're here from Boston, Massachusetts, USA. Um, and we would like to speak to you this afternoon about the quest for prion disease therapeutics from the perspective of patients turned researchers and the reasons why, despite all of the challenges ahead of us, we are very optimistic about the prospects for treatments for these diseases. So we'll, we'll lead with a bit of our personal story. Sonia and I met in 2006, and we were married in summer 2009. It was just a few months after that that her mother fell ill with a rapidly progressive dementia of unknown cause. She was seen at Brigham and Women's Hospital, Cleveland Clinic, some of the most advanced centers in the US, um, but no diagnosis was forthcoming. CJD was floated as a possibility early on, but ruled out, we were told, on the basis of a negative 1433 spinal tap. In the meantime, her decline was precipitous. Within five months, she was akinetic and mute. Um, but without a diagnosis, it was very hard for the family to gather around next steps. So she was kept alive for an additional five months on life support. At the end, uh, at the end of those five months, um, CJD came back as a potential diagnosis. Um, based this time on a positive 1433 test. So on the basis of that information, the family decided to take her off of life support and she passed away a couple of days later. Now, Sonia and I were left with these letters, CJD, in our heads, which I'm not actually sure we'd even ever heard before. Um, so we started Googling and trying to learn a bit about it. We learned that some cases are genetic, but we weren't so worried yet because there was no family history. It was only several months later that we learned from the autopsy results that she had actually died of fatal familial insomnia and came to understand that this put me at 50-50 risk for having inherited the disease allele. So Eric and I learned about ourselves in that moment that we are the kind of people who need to know and we set about right away trying to get me tested. So we know now that you can sequence the PRMP open reading frame in about a day, but from the clinical perspective, that process of getting tested took about two months. And those two months of 50-50 limbo were, for, for the two of us, the, far, the by far the hardest part of this whole process. Um, the 50-50 split gave our minds no place to rest. Um, we were thinking constantly about the risk. Um, but for all that thinking, we had no idea how the news would affect our life one way or the other. So um, after two months, a medical geneticist looked us in the eye and said, the same mutation that was found in your mother was found in you. And here's the genetic test report. Um, so after this, we spent a few days grieving, and family and friends came to visit and told us things like, this too shall pass. You know, you will eventually adjust to this information, and life will go on, so don't worry. Um, but we learned another thing about ourselves, which was that um, we weren't willing to go back to the same life we had been living, but have things always be that much worse. And so as it turns out, life never did get back to normal. So where were we in our lives at this stage? Um, I was a recent law school graduate. Eric was working as a software engineer in the transportation sector. Our memory of biology was probably high school level at best. Um, but we set about trying to learn everything we could about prion diseases and FFI from the internet, from books, from friends who were scientists, from some of the people in this room. Um, we owe a special thank you to Walker Jackson for his heroic patience in the very beginning, teaching us the difference between prion protein and a prion. Um, we enrolled in night classes. Our initial goal in all this was really to become our own advocates. We felt like we had learned from my mom's disease course that these diseases are too rare for the medical establishment to reliably be able to connect you to the progress being made on the research side. Um, but as we went deeper, we got drawn in. Um, and within a few months, we had left our jobs. We were working in neurogenetics at Massachusetts General Hospital, and we were doing science full time. Um, in parallel, we founded Prion Alliance, a nonprofit with the goal of funding research, ours and other people's, into prion disease therapeutics. And Eric started blogging, here we have it, at cureffi.org, um, an ongoing effort that I think many of you are aware of. And uh, we've now worked for two years at Mass General Hospital, and we just decided to take the next step in our careers, which is this fall. We will be uh, starting our PhDs in biology at Harvard Medical School. We made that decision based on 
Our feeling that Boston is an incredible place for science. There's a ton of innovative ideas coming out of there. Our hope is that maybe the biggest impact we can have is to be the bridge and connect those ideas to the prion world, which is something we'll only be able to do through collaborations. So we're very excited to work with many of you in this room, and our hope is to, to be friends with everyone. Um, so that's our story, and we have come out of this being huge believers that all genetic information is actionable. We're incredibly lucky to even have this genetic information because given the absence of family history, uh, it was just as likely that Sonia's mom's case would never have been diagnosed as being genetic. Um, but in fact, if you look in the literature, um, EuroCJD has reported that actually the majority of patients with genetic prion disease lack a family history. And uh, I've seen a similar figure as their figure um, in, in work that I've done with uh, Michael Geshwin, Simon Mead, Stephen Collins, and Inga Zare. Um, so there's kind of been uh, you know, this long-standing mystery of how, how can we reconcile genetic disease with frequent lack of a family history. Some of that may just be de novo mutations. We, we suspect that may actually be the case for Sonia's mom. Um, but uh, there's another, you know, another contributor to this. So I wanted to give a quick recap of our poster, which uh, we had to take down, but um, I'm happy to chat to people about it. So uh, we looked in a large controlled data set, 80,000 human exomes, and we found that a subset of the pathogenic PRNP mutations are actually seen in controls at a frequency much higher than we would have expected based on how rare genetic prion disease is. Um, so we're kind of motivating a shift in thinking where some of these mutations really are highly penetrant Mendelian diseases, and others may just be on the spectrum from you know, weak to strong risk factor. Um, so, so going back to the genetic counseling issue for a second, um, we're, we're both big believers that patients have a right to choose whether they want to know their genetic information or not. And for us, it was clearly the right decision to know. And for other people, it's clearly the right decision not to know. It's a very personal thing. Uh, but in order to even have that choice, patients need to be aware that it's a possibility that there may be a mutation, even when there's no family history. So we hope that uh, screening for mutations in all prion disease cases will become more commonplace. Uh, on the other hand, in, in parallel with that, uh, there's going to need to be, a, a, you know, we think a, a bit of a shift in thinking in how we communicate that risk to patients, because all of the mutations are different and it's an evolving picture. So that's a, a window into the work we've been involved in on the genetic side. Um, but moving forward, we are really interested in working on therapeutics. Um, I'm 30 years old right now. The average age of onset for FFI is around 50. So on expectation, we think this gives us about 20 years to make what contribution we can towards moving the field towards therapeutics. People ask us all the time if this is a realistic goal and if this is a realistic timeline. And we're prepared to say yes. Obviously, um, it won't be easy. And there are no guarantees. Um, but we do think that this is a reasonable goal to at least aspire to. And in order to flesh that out a bit, we thought we would change gears for a moment and talk at a very broad level about how we view some of the recent developments and setbacks and how we've been conceptualizing the paths forward towards therapeutics. So for starters, um, some basic facts that we are collectively lucky to know about prion disease. Um, in order to have prion disease, first you need to have PRPC expression. Prions need to be able to replicate and accumulate. And at a certain point, they need to be able to kill neurons. Um, one way we've been thinking about the paths forward is just according to these three sort of broad mechanistic targets. To spend a few moments first on expression, we have elegant genetic proofs of concept that if you can turn down PRPC expression, you can slow down prion disease. And if you can turn off PRPC expression, you can stop prion disease. In theory, there are some attractive things about this kind of approach. We think maybe it wouldn't be subject to things like drug resistance and strain specificity. Um, how might we go about it therapeutically? One option would be to use biologicals, siRNAs, as Giovanna Malucci has done, ASOs, as the Prusner lab has done, um, CRISPR-Cas9 being the latest arrival on the scene. Of course, for all of these macromolecules, the huge unsolved problem is how to deliver them in large enough number to a large enough fraction of the 100 billion heavily guarded post-mitotic neurons in the adult human brain. 
So this is an engineering hurdle that remains. Um, but our hope is that any progress in this domain would be generalizable enough that it will be an attractive challenge and people will continue to chip away at it over the years to come. The other option would be to try to ratchet down PRPC expression with a small molecule. I'm not aware of a precedent for a small molecule that's able to selectively decrease the expression of one protein, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. And the potential elegance of a solution like this is such that we're very grateful to the people, Korean Las Mesas, the, Pri the Prusner Lab, that, are, um, that have put effort into this strategy. Um, <clears throat> the second broad category we think about is targeting prion replication, which here I'm sort of defining broadly as anything that reduces accumulation of prions. The original genetic proof of concept for this, of course, is that even expression of a small amount of a dominant negative peptide can have an outsized effect at delaying the progression of prion disease. And the more recent proof of concept is that we've now seen a few different small molecules that are very potent inhibitors of RML prion replication in vivo and have actually doubled the survival time of infected mice. Um, so the, the problem is, as you heard about from Dr. Prusner on Tuesday night, um, none of those molecules have yet shown efficacy against any human prion strain. And that's what we've seen in our work as well. So a few months ago, we funded a study with Jim Mastriani to test on the 138B in his mouse model of A117V GSS. And it's, it's ongoing, but the preliminary result from that is it looks like we don't see a survival benefit in that model either. So it may be that the strategy of screening against RML-infected cells to try to find a drug for the human disease has run its course. And what paths forward does that leave us with? It's a, it's a big challenge. So it, it seems like either we need to finally figure out how to get a human-infected cell line we can screen against, um, or we need to finally figure out how to take a, a cell-free prion conversion reaction and make it highly reproducible and scalable and maintain the authentic in vivo infectious conformation so we could screen against that. Huge unsolved challenges in the field right now, but we're hopeful that maybe something can work out. Finally, in terms of neurotoxicity, this is arguably the category up here that we know the least about, but over the past few days, we've heard from Giovanna Malucci and from Adriano Aguzzi about some of the neurotoxic pathways that are rapidly coming to light. So our sort of open questions on this subject are, how many neurotoxic pathways are we looking at in prion disease? What's the overlap between them from strain to strain? How many would we have to target in order to see a robust therapeutic effect? And what are the implications of going after what is relatively such a short phase in the overall disease course? I think as we learn more about these pathways, we're going to learn a ton about PRPC. And it's also going to be very exciting to be able to put non-PRP targets on the table, which will further open the door to be able to us being able to go after these diseases with multi-pronged approaches. Um, so uh, to, to summarize a bit of what we're getting at here, um, on one hand, there are some huge unsolved questions in the prion field right now. And that's why it's really exciting to be at this conference and hear all of the things that people are doing to try to answer these questions. It's, it's amazing. On the other hand, uh, we will also argue that if you take a few steps back and look at the prion field from afar, uh, it is actually amazing how much is known about prion disease. And uh, most importantly, we think, is simply that we know the molecular mechanism of the disease. Um, and that is just so fundamental for trying to think about therapeutics. Um, secondary to that, um, I think there's also an embarrassment of riches in terms of tools available for studying these diseases. You know, mouse models that really get the real disease, antibodies against every part of the protein, assays for studying it. These are, these are all things that other disease communities would be very envious of. Um, and so when I hear these discouraging facts and figures about the pharmaceutical industry these days, things like discovering a drug costs $11 billion, it takes 15 years, 95% of clinical trials fail, um, I would argue that a lot of that failure is um, due to not understanding the, the fundamental molecular mechanism of the diseases we're trying to treat. And, you know, going after targets where we, we aren't actually sure that that target would treat the disease even if we could reach it. Um, and so that's why, in spite of all the challenges for prion disease, you know, being so rapidly lethal, small patient population, small market size, in, in spite of all of that, um, we think that because we understand what these diseases are, we're actually in a really good position. As a 
A final thought for today. Um, Eric and I wanted to share something with all of you. Um, we're approaching the sort of next transition in our scientific careers, and we've taken this moment to set down a few principles that we hope will guide us in science. And uh, we share this list with you today in the hopes that you will add to it in conversation with us um, and hold us to it if you feel that we ever need a reminder. Um, so here it is. Um, number one, Eric and I should be disciplined. We should do the right experiment even when it's not the easy experiment. Number two, we should be honest. We should report our results, be they positive or negative. Um, number three, we should plan well and design experiments that will be informative, regardless of whether or not our hypotheses turn out to be true. Um, and number four, we aim to be transparent and to share all data. Number five is to stay focused on our goal, which means that we should be grateful if someone beats us to an important discovery or refutes something that we thought we knew, because only the truth moves us forward towards our goal. Related to which, and you know, probably we will have to prove this to a lot of you, but um, to be objective. Um, we view our personal investment in this as patience as a strength rather than a weakness. That personal investment is our daily reminder to be objective, because only the truth moves us forward. And finally, seven, don't make enemies. We really want to be friends with all of you, and we hope that you want to be friends with us. Um, so on that note, please keep in touch. This is how you can reach us. And thank you for the opportunity to speak today, for your attention, and for everything that you do.